1703, Tsar Peter the Great founded his capital city, St. Petersburg, in the swampy delta mouth of the river Neva. Under the most severe conditions, his subjects were ordered to make its swampy terrain habitable. The transformation was amazing. A fine example, the Winter Palace, one of many royal residences. An outstanding Russian Baroque monument created by St. Petersburg's most prominent architects. Here, Russia's largest museum and one of the most well-stocked, the Eremitage, with more than two and a half million exhibits. Since the time of Peter the Great, Russian rulers have purchased many major works of art. But it was Catherine the Great who acquired complete collections from the auction houses of Europe. There are 11 works by Cézanne here, 35 by Matisse and 36 by Picasso. It was only in 1922 that these collections and the Winter Palace were opened to the public. Through these halls pass the ghosts of great artists who have made a priceless and historic impression. The Eremitage is home to Greek and Roman treasures and also to many of the Dutch masters. Since 1782, the Castle Square has featured a most impressive monument of Peter I, named the Bronze Horseman, after a poem by Russia's greatest poet, Alexander Pushkin. It was donated by Catherine the Great. A setting for military parades, the square has also been used for demonstrations and rebellions. Completed in 1823, the Admiralty, with its needle-shaped, gold-plated tower, is one of the city's most famous landmarks. Its grand architecture symbolizes the emergence of Russia as a naval power. Also here, the marvellous rectangular building of St. Isaac's Cathedral, which, at a height of 100 metres, has the third largest dome in the world. 24,000 tree stumps were used for its foundations, and this splendid St. Petersburg monument can accommodate a congregation of 14,000. Almost at the centre of Isaac's Square stands the equestrian statue of Tsar Nicholas I. Peter Klott created it from designs by Montserrat. The most conservative European ruler of his time, he was very unpopular with his people.
At the widest point of the River Neva sits the regal and dominant Peter and Paul Fortress. Its foundations were laid on 16th of May 1703. Tsar Peter I wanted to protect his capital city from Sweden and to guard the passage to the Baltic. Over 20,000 workers took just a few months to build a foundation strong enough to support the six-cornered building. Six defence bastions covered all directions. In fact, the fortress was never attacked. At the centre of the fortress is the Peter and Paul Cathedral. Its slim, gilded bell tower and its tall, narrow spire are an emblem of the city. The Swiss architect Trezzini built the cathedral in early Dutch Baroque style. The Peter and Paul Cathedral was the burial place of the Tsars and, until 1858, the city's main place of worship. The bust and marble coffin of Peter the Great is situated in the first row of Tsar's tombs. The three-aisled main room is connected by pillars and decorated with wall paintings and flags captured in battle. The Russian aristocracy was unhappy about the creation of a new city in the remote northwest of the country, also threatened by the Swedes. Many aristocrats were forced to settle there. Its people were also uneasy for a long time. Life was arduous and expensive because everything had to come from afar. However, St. Petersburg became Russia's capital city and remained so until 1918 when Lenin and his revolutionary Bolshevik government moved to Moscow. This famous warship is more than a hundred years old and attained historical importance on the 25th of October 1917. The Imperial fleet took up position at the Lieutenant Schmidt Bridge to prevent it being raised. Around 10 p.m. the crew of the Aurora fired the initial shot, the signal to take the Winter Palace by storm and to bring down the Imperial regime. The most colourful church in Russia is the Resurrection of Christ Cathedral. In Old Russian style, modelled on St. Basil's Cathedral in Moscow. Tsar Alexander III ordered the cathedral to be built at the place where, in 1881, his father Alexander II had been killed by a bomb planted by a revolutionary group. In those days, this place of worship, built from granite, marble and coloured bricks, was famous for its magnificent interior, and especially for the mosaics, which cover the 7,000 square metres of its ceilings and walls. The cathedral is currently being restored, but its reopening is still a long way off. Carlo Rossi, the Italian-Russian exponent of classicism, created the Square of Arts. 
named thus because it is surrounded by various museums, theatres and palaces. Rossi produced designs for each building's façade, which were duly implemented. Through its total architectural conception, a uniform style was achieved which included characteristics of Western European design. After the 50 years of its construction, St. Petersburg compared to Paris and London. For visitors to St. Petersburg, a walk over the Nevsky Prospekt is essential. In 1712, and forged through swampy wasteland, this four and a half kilometer long, 60 meter wide road was built to connect the Admiralty to the shipyard. Directly behind the Square of the Arts begins the unique Rossi Street. This street, which used to be called Theatre Street, and only much later received the name of its creator, is as long as its mirrored image buildings on both sides, 220 metres. The width of the street is equivalent to the height of the buildings, precisely 22 metres. The plan was for a replica of St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome. However, the actual result was of highly independent Russian classicism. Kazan Cathedral, the most impressive and awe-inspiring cathedral in St. Petersburg. It can be entered from all the points of the compass, and its bronze doors are a copy of the Paradise Gateway to the Baptisterium in Florence. After the war against Napoleon, the cathedral was built to commemorate Russia's triumph against France, Later, the communist dictators transformed it into a museum. Only since Mikhail Gorbachev have church services been resumed. As the city was built on swamp land, the tunnels of the Petersburg Metro could only be constructed in the lower clay layer. On no account is a visit to the Russian farmer's market to be missed. Here, the atmosphere is a unique mixture of the Western European market and Oriental bazaar. There's loud haggling and every kopeck is argued over. Of course, goods can be tried prior to purchase and products and specialities from all the former Soviet republics can be found. Vegetables, cheese, cucumbers, meat and much more. Sometimes farm produce is also offered on the streets. Not totally legal, but mostly tolerated by the authorities. Families and friends met up in St. Petersburg as frequently as possible. The attraction was obvious. Feasts fit for a czar, and vodka, champagne and wine flowing like water. Of course, song and dance featured at every party. 
Today, traditional folklore is performed at special festivals. One can still experience the joie de vivre and passion of the Russian soul. The fascination of great tradition still lives on today. The five-domed blue and white Resurrection Cathedral of Smolny Cloister is one of the most beautiful works by the Baroque architect Rastrelli. The name of the cloister is a reminder that in the city's early years, the tar which was poured here for the ships was called Smola. No nuns ever lived here, and until the 1920s, religious services were held in the cathedral. Nowadays, concerts and exhibitions are held here, and parts of the cloister serve as office space. Nearly 27 kilometers from Petersburg lies Pavlovsk. Located here is a summer residence of Tsar Paul I, son of Catherine the Great. Of amazing dimensions, the palace was created by five of the leading architects of the era, namely Cameron, Brenna, Kwarengi, Varanichin, and Rossi. They also designed its classical interior. Whether parade halls or private rooms, everywhere the splendor of multifarious works of art and superb interior design greets the eye. During a short visit, it's difficult to take in the overflowing luxury of imperial times. In 1782, the construction of the latest summer residence of the St. Petersburg Tsar began, named Pavlovsk after its owner. The park counts as the most beautiful landscaped garden in Russia. With its breathtaking landscaped features, and stretching across nearly 1,500 acres, this estate indicates the magnitude of the imperial era. Charles Cameron created a harmony in a symbiosis of nature and man. Scarcely three kilometers from Pavlovsk lies Pushkin, the so-called Tsar village. Another palace with amazing features, the enormous Catherine Palace. This summer palace was originally designed by Rastrelli in resplendent Baroque style for Tsarina Elizabeth. In contrast, its interior was created in Robert Adams style by the Scottish architect Charles Cameron for Catherine the Great, after whom this unique palace was later named. The charm and luxury of this complex immediately captivate each visitor. Not in size, but certainly in splendor, the Catherine Palace can be compared to St. Petersburg's Winter Palace. More than 100 kilos of gold were used for the gilding of its interior. And only this palace possesses an enfilade, a suite of rooms. When each door of the first floor parade halls is open, it's possible to see from one end to the other, through all its 300 meters. Special mention should be made of the historic Amber Room, 
the walls of which were totally covered in amber. It disappeared mysteriously during World War II and has been partially reconstructed today. South of the palace, a landscaped park was created, the focal point of which is a large ornamental pond. Beneath its old trees, tranquility reigns supreme. The view from the wonderful park to the splendid blue and gold facade of Catherine Palace assails the senses. Tsar Peter the Great had a great reverence for the West. He had a vision of a palace outside the city which would be more beautiful than the Palace of Versailles. Thus, the Grand Palace of Peterhof was built. The Versailles of the East. Its historic image may be more imposing, but its extraordinary location at Finnish Bay gives this most magnificent of all Russian Tsar summer residences its unique atmosphere. The Tsar himself chose its location and sketched designs for the park and the palace. It was only in 1752 that the total complex was completed by the succeeding Tsarina. Characteristic of the Peterhof is the position of the Grand Palace, which was built on an embankment 20 meters high. This divides the area into an upper and lower park. Landward, the Baroque estate is entered via the parade gate and upper park, at the center of which is the Neptune fountain. But more impressive, and therefore more prestigious, was the arrival of guests from the sea. A 400-metre salt water canal leads right up to the castle, its focal point being the lower park, where visitors reach the Grand Cascade, which leads to the palace terrace. This is one of the most beautiful and perhaps the largest fountain displays in the world. Its water flows over two wide steps into a vast marble basin, in the middle of which stands the gilded Samson Fountain. The water circulates without a pump, using a clever system of collection pools and the laws of gravity. The impressive dimensions of the lower park underline the fact that this residence was a symbol of Russia's newly gained naval power. St. Petersburg, Venice of the North, was Russia's new gateway to the West. An architectural concept and almost unique with some Western European influence. As Tsar Peter I began to build his capital, Moscow's buildings were constructed of wood, which Napoleon turned into rubble and ash. St. Petersburg was therefore unique because almost the entire nucleus of its 18th century inner city remained intact. Russian Baroque and Russian Classicism were established. New architectural art forms. St. Petersburg is a protected monument of the Tsar era. An imperial metropolis.